Hi, friends, and welcome back to day two of InterVarsity's Together 2020. I'm Steve, one of your MCs, and I'm also the Area Ministry Director for InterVarsity's work in Southern Minnesota. And it's Lacey here, your other trusty MC and staff at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. InterVarsity longs to see every corner of every campus have the opportunity to hear about Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And if you are joining us for the very first time, whether you're a student, faculty member, donor, or ministry partner, or someone that simply stumbled across this video, we want to give you an extra special welcome. Thank you for being here. That's right. And if you want to catch up on what you missed yesterday after listening to this, last night's video is on YouTube and it's on our channel Together 2020. And we welcome the rest of you to find it as well so you can share it with friends, family, and strangers. Mm -hmm. And to get, tonight, we are going to continue growing in knowledge and love of the Lord as we pray together, worship together, and hear teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. And to begin our time today, we will be praying again for our brothers and sisters in the larger movement of the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students, IFES. And yesterday, we prayed broadly for faithful witness to Jesus in college and universities around the world. But today, and for the next two days, we're going to zoom in to different parts of our worldwide movement, hearing about what God is doing there and praying for them and supporting them in their financial needs. And tonight, we're going to hear about the movement in Belgium, known as ICTHUS. And if you are no stranger to InterVarsity conferences, you may have noticed that we've had the opportunity to partner with them in uh, on several different occasions. And I am really excited to partner with the movement in Belgium again tonight. So let's hear from Tom, the General Secretary of ICTHUS, who will share with us what God is doing in and through students and staff in Belgium. So hi there again. My name is Tom de Krane. I'm the General Secretary of ICTUS, which is the Flemish IFS movement in Belgium. Would you find it weird to study the Bible with me? This is the question that two of our staff workers and two students from our smallest groups took upon themselves in this crazy Corona time. Each one of them made the commitment to ask this question to one friend, one fellow student, a relative or acquaintance. Not to put it off, Sam, who some of you might know, asked one of his friends from college he had only spoken once in the last 12 years straight after the meeting where they had agreed on this plan. Sam was pretty sure his friend would say no, and that way he could still proudly say he had done as he had committed to. Two days later, he was reading Mark's Gospel online with his friend Hannelore. They decided to meet up seven more times so they could finish all the studies in Uncover Mark together. Ruth, the other staff worker, and the two students got a positive answer too. A WhatsApp was started to encourage each other, pray and to be updated. The challenge was presented to others too. So far, 11 students and staff workers have joined the WhatsApp group. Not me, because I'm clinging on to my dumb phone for sheer life. But all of those 11 have gotten a yes on their question. So apparently it isn't that weird to read the Bible with us. One of the students even joined and said she would agree to do so because it was online. And this way, her Muslim father wouldn't be able to find an actual Bible. So we helped the students by providing a digital Uncover version. And we also sent a real copy of Uncover, which is a tool we use to reach out and read the Bible together with non-Christians. Lara, who, has, who was co-responsible for the making of this tool into Dutch and to make it culturally uh, appropriate, is providing online training on how to use the tool Uncover well. So at the middle of this pandemic, at least 11 substantial faith conversations are happening or will be happening soon. Please pray for these students and staff members as they engage with the friends of theirs and while they engage with the scriptures. Please also pray that we may be able to fill the more than five vacancies we have at the moment, so more of these kind of initiatives can take place and more students can be reached with the gospel. And lastly, please also pray for our finances. Some of our donors have already come to us and said, well, we have to cut our donation because we have lost our job during this crisis. Please pray that we have the money to continue the work we're doing. 
God bless. Thank you for praying for us and know that we are praying for you too. We will take a moment now to pray for these things. And you're welcome to pray out loud or quietly. And if you're on our website, you can click on the link below to submit a prayer request that will be received, I'm sure, with much joy by our brothers and sisters in Belgium. Let's pray. Amen. And uh, I want you guys to remember that we also get to receive the joy of generously giving of our money to support this movement. So if the Lord is pressing on your heart to give, the link is below on our website if you're watching it live at ivtogether2020.com. And our time of prayer is actually not over yet tonight. See, the Lord has burdened the hearts of many of his people over the recent tragedy of George Floyd's death. And we took a moment to acknowledge this yesterday and offered prayer ministry. And that will be available again tonight. But we also invited our speaker for this week, Amy Staley, to join us live to pray with us. Amy, I will leave them in your capable hands. Thanks, Lacey. As Lacey said, my name is Amy, and along with being your speaker this week from the Sermon on the Mount, I'm also the area ministry director for the Twin Cities, the place where George Floyd suffered a brutal death on Monday, May 25th, at the corner of Chicago and 38th Street in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He was handcuffed while a police officer pinned him to the ground with his knee over his neck as Floyd called out, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. It's a heavy week in Minneapolis, and it's a heavy week in our country. While our Sermons on the Mount address Jesus' essential, upside-down mission of justice in an unjust world, because the sermons were pre-recorded, they do not specifically address the tragedy, pain, injustice, and grief of this week. So this evening, I'm going to lead us in prayer for Mr. George Floyd, a Black man made in the image of God. Will you pray with me? Creator God, we thank you for making George Floyd in your image. We thank you that he is fearfully and wonderfully made, and we say his name because he is one of your children. Tonight, Jesus, we lament and mourn his death. We join with you, Jesus, in your suffering over this act of injustice and over the systemic and institutional injustice and racism that is so powerful in our world. We pray for George Floyd's family and community, and we ask for your comfort and peace and wisdom to be with them. And tonight, Jesus, we pray too for our Black brothers and sisters here at Together 2020 who are experiencing this in a deeply personal way. Jesus, would you bless those who mourn? And for those of us of every other race and ethnicity, would you break our hearts for what breaks yours and lead us in the path to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Would those of us who are comfortable be disturbed and would those of us who are disturbed be comforted? Jesus, we pray and ask for a new way, a whole way, a way that only you can show us by your acquaintance with suffering, your power to bring new life, and your preference toward the marginalized. Jesus, we pray that you would bring your justice in Minneapolis, in the state of Minnesota, in our country, and in our world. We trust in you for the kingdom to come, even as we mourn in the now but not yet. In your name, creator God, King Jesus, faithful Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thanks, Amy. 
We realize that a lot of you are feeling very deep emotions or have questions about what happened in Minneapolis. So on Friday morning at 10 a.m., we'll be offering three different processing rooms where you can share your experiences and questions. There's gonna be one room for black students, another room for students of color that are not black, and another room for white students. All three of these rooms are at 10 a.m. and you can find the links for those rooms at ivtogether2020.com. And if anyone, any of you would like prayer with someone tonight at any point, just like yesterday, we have response rooms open from 7 to 8 p.m. Central. In addition to those prayer rooms, there's a room that you can go to to ask questions about what you're seeing and hearing, as well as a room to talk to someone about planting an intervarsity ministry near you. Just go back to that website, ivtogether2020.com for details. You'll see the links below the live video. Now, I'm going to invite you to worship however you're comfortable. You can sit, you can stand, you can lay, you can listen, you can sing, you can cry. Because here comes the Urbana 2018 worship team to lead us in worship. Spoken tonight and then light was and who is he? Set the sun and stars above and who is he? Who formed the galaxies? God is, God is, God is. Can you help me out? Say, sing it. Who is he? Say, who is he? Breathe into man is very life, and that's Adam. Who is he? Set his son to sacrifice, and say, who is he? Who calls me by my name, God is. God is. God is. 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 Chorus goes like this. I call him master. Sing our Savior, our Savior that's, who God is. that's who God is. Sing Father, is. Redeemer, say, Father, oh, Redeemer, sing my healer, my healer that's who God is. Sing, who is he? Say, who is he? Should he come again someday? And you say, who is he? He is a truth, he is a way. And you say, who is he? Holds the universe in place. God is. God is. God is. Oh, God is. Oh, we call him. Say that's who he is. Say, say that's who he is. That's who he is. Say that's who he is. That's who got it. That's who got it. Sing it again. Say that's who he is. That's who he is. That's who he is. That's who he is. That's who got it. That's who got it. That's who got it. That's who got it. Oh, yeah, 
yes he is Andy can you help me sing say He's unchangeable Unshakable Unstoppable That's who you are Unchangeable Unshakable Unstoppable That's who you are You are God time began you were on your throne you are God alone and right now in the good times and bad God you're still on your throne cause you are God alone wow that is beautiful and what a comfort it is to know that he is on his throne and that he is God alone. Thank you so much for lifting your voice alongside us. Next we will be hearing from Nahita, a freshman from the University of Minnesota who will share with us how God has called her into leadership. Here. Hello, my name is Nahita Andrea. I'm a first year student at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities studying nursing. Uh, so the prompt I received was what is one way God has called me into leadership within the last year and what is something that he has spoke to me. Uh, first thing that comes to my head would be that I have truly throughout my life been called into leadership in a very like, you know, formal academic manner, leading the line in kindergarten. Um, being a member of NHS in high school, uh, co-leading different social groups and organizations in my high schools, and even this fall being um, opportune to work as a board member for the nursing board at my school. Um, and I also feel that recently God has really called me into leading in ministry. Uh, and this has been something that has really humbled me because, you know, it's easy to be like, a leader in the world and a leader for the world because everyone's in it everyone wants to do it um but when it comes to leading ministry i know that that is truly um such a place of intimacy and such a place of um depth and i just feel that he has called me out not just because i've exhibited leadership in the past but because he wants me to step up and be more fruitful and confident in who i am as a christian and a verse that came to mind that i just kind of read for myself oftentimes is ephesians 6 verse 19 which reads and pray for me too ask god to give me the right word so i can boldly explain god's mysterious plan that the good news is for jews and gentiles alike um that was written by paul but that's just something that I pray for myself and that I constantly ask God to give me as I go forth in leadership and ministry, just that he um, keeps me in his power and just guides my steps as I go as a leader. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nahita. Steve and I have really been encouraged by your humility and your dependence upon the Lord in your leadership. And we are praying for you. Now, the time has come to listen to the teaching from the Sermon on the Mount. And Amy, who you met earlier, will be reading tonight from Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. So you can grab a Bible or pull it up on an app on your phone uh, if you'd like to read along when she guides you there. 
Also, my personal recommendation is that you grab a pen or paper or have a note open on your phone or your laptop, because you may want to jot down a few things that she shares tonight. Without further ado, let's hear from Amy. Well, hey everyone, and welcome back to night two here as we dive into the Sermon on the Mount. My name is Amy Staley, if you didn't get a chance to meet me last night. And tonight, as we look at Jesus' words for the people of God, we get to talk about doing life with other people. Now, one of the ways that I sometimes describe people who are difficult in our lives uh, is sandpaper people. Uh, they kind of grate on me like sandpaper. Probably my biggest example of my sandpaper person uh, was back when I was a college student and I was headed up to a camp for the summer to, to be there, and I carpooled with a group of people. I got in the car with people who I didn't know so we could take off for this camp, and by about 15 minutes in, I had a feeling that this was going to be a rough car ride. Uh, by about hour five, I had a splitting headache because this was just not my kind of conversation. These were not my kind of people, particularly the driver. And I started to pray a very holy prayer. Lord, I will do anything for you all summer if I am not in a cohort. We were kind of in cohorts for the summer. If I am not in a cohort with this guy, the driver, I'll do anything. We just didn't agree on things. The things he talked about were not things that I cared about. I thought he talked about himself all the time. I thought he interrupted all the time. I just didn't want to be around him, frankly. By the time we hit hour seven, he got a speeding ticket, which definitely added, you know, some fun or definitely not fun to the trip. By the time we arrived at camp, I, you know, I pulled my two long legs out of that two crunch car and I'm just thinking, I am, I am done now. And we still have to go to all the camp stuff for the rest of the evening. By the time we get to the main session for camp, I continue to repeat my not so holy prayer. Lord, I will do anything for you all summer if I am not in a cohort with this guy. And I'm sure you can imagine what happened next. I don't think I'll ever forget even where I was sitting in the room when my name came up on the screen with this guy's and I realized we were about to send the summer in some pretty close proximity and I was not here for it. I think I stopped breathing, to be honest. Um, I survived, so I didn't stop breathing, but it felt like I stopped breathing. I made it through the rest of the session. I hightailed it out of there and then I called my mom. Later, my mom told me that she did not understand 75% of what I was saying because I was crying so hard. That's how worried I was about this summer with Sandpaper Man, uh, always around. I wish I could tell you it was a great summer and that we came to really enjoy each other and get along really well and that everything was really good, uh, but it was frankly a really hard summer. And when I look back on it, one of the things that I learned about the most is what it means to interact with other people what it means to deal with conflict, what it means for me to manage my own responses of anger, of frustration toward someone else, and what it means for me to respond to their anger, frustration toward me. Now, I told you that I, I hope that you, you know, I hope, I know you all have a sandpaper person, but I do hope that that person's not in your house right now. Uh, that's what I want to tell you. I do hope that person's not in your house right now. If they are, you probably have a wonderful opportunity for formation to be more like Jesus in your life. Um, but I understand that it can be a little bit tricky. But for all of us, we probably have someone and some ones that bring out in us that tension, anger, frustration, and we need to learn how to deal with it. Because frankly, when we don't deal with that kind of stuff, Jesus has some warnings for us. So tonight we're going to look at Matthew 5, starting in verse 17, and we're going to look at what Jesus says about how we engage and interact with others, both some tools that we can use in our relationships with other people, but also what needs to be going on in our own heart in these situations. So why don't you pray with me, and then we'll take a look. Just thank you for the different houses, places we are in right now. Thank you for the ways that you work, even in difficult relationships in our lives. Thank you for the way that you have worked in me. Um, and God, I pray that as tonight, that as we open um, ourselves up to your word, that we would allow you to work in us, even in the uncomfortable parts, Lord. We love you. In your name, amen. All right, you can grab your Bible if you have it, or it's going to be on the PowerPoint, but uh, Matthew 5, starting in verse 17. I'm going to read the first um, paragraph and then take a pause because it sort of helps set the stage for the rest of what's happening in this chapter. Jesus says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, 
will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will become least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Just places high value here on teaching and practicing, putting into practice what he's about to say. But he also makes sure that he says, what I'm about to say does not erase or abolish the law or the prophets. So in the law or the prophets referring uh, to the law in the Old Testament that we see, much of the Sermon on the Mount sort of has um, whiffs or fragrances of Moses getting the law from God back in the Old Testament. When Jesus first sits down uh, for the Sermon on the Mount, maybe people would have had that in the back of their mind. It's a significant moment. And what Jesus is about to say is he's about to say, you have heard it said, but I tell you, you have heard it said, but I tell you. This could definitely come across as erasing or abolishing the law of the prophets, but Jesus makes very, very clear that that's not what he's doing at all. It says, not the smallest letter, the least stroke of the pen, a way we might say that every dotted I or cross T will be there. So Jesus isn't getting rid of the law, but what then is he exactly doing if he's come to fulfill it? Jesus, in his statements, he isn't saying that um, he's not opposing the law, but he's opposing an illegitimate interpretation of the law that values regulations over character. So Jesus is opposing an illegitimate interpretation of the law that values regulation over character. Jesus is about to deal with six different categories, anger and murder, adultery and lust, divorce, oaths, personal retaliation, and hatred of enemies. In each of these, there will be a you have heard it said, but I tell you, where Jesus deepens the command to bring out the character of the people of God. A super simple way to think about this is when you're around kids, you know, whether it's your little siblings, your babysitting, your cousins, whatever, and you tell them, don't hit so-and-so, don't hit your brother, don't hit your cousin, don't hit your, you know, don't hit your friend. Uh, and then five minutes later, they bite them, and you're like, didn't we just have this conversation? Ah, oh, we did it. Biting is in a different category for them than hitting. That's a moment where the child is following the regulation, but not the character of the law. They maybe need some character work. And so when Jesus is saying these, you have heard it said, but I tell you. Again, it's about character, not regulation. The six that he points out are potentially significant because they're ways that the disciples might have thought they were doing pretty good. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't divorced anyone. I haven't committed adultery with anyone. I've been good about my oaths. You know, they, they might have thought they were doing pretty well. But when Jesus brings in the character side of it, woo, that makes everyone maybe perk up a little bit. And these are things that the Pharisees may have been doing. And Jesus says that the righteousness of his people needs to surpass the Pharisees in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not about just regulation, but about character. We don't have time to go into all six of these tonight, but I'll encourage you that as you read them on your own, you can be looking for the ways of how is Jesus deepening just a simple regulation and adding depth to character as he teaches about it. But the one we are going to look at is the first one about anger and murder. So you can pick up with me in verse 21. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus has some serious words about anger here and the way that it plays out in people's lives. He says, you've heard it said, do not murder. Good for you. But I tell you that even someone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And he says that anyone who calls them raka, which would be an insult that means empty-headed one, or you fool, another kind of deep insult in this time, would be in danger of the fire of hell. Why is anger so lethal? I want to be clear here first that uh, Jesus isn't talking about anger, all anger. 
because it does say in scripture, in your anger, do not sin. So there is room for anger without sinning. And that kind of anger, it's the sort of anger that we have about injustice, about wrongs in our world. That kind of anger is godly and good anger. But this kind of anger that Jesus is talking about is anger toward a brother or sister, the kind of anger that results in actually dehumanizing them and even murdering part of their identity in God by the way that our anger is lashed out at them. Anger can be a sinister thing. We say things when we're angry that we wouldn't say otherwise. And often in our culture today, because anger is seen as almost an acceptable sin, we shrug it off as, ah, oh, they were just upset. They were just angry. They were just frustrated. I'll let it go. But in reality, those things are sinful. They're bad. They're lethal. They chip away at people's identity as children of God. They chip away at those blessed R's that we looked at yesterday, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the identity and mission of God's people. And frankly, they actually chip away at us as well. Because when we are so angry with someone that we are not able to see them the way that God sees them, that chips away at our identity and the goodness of who we are as well. It's like being fragmented beings rather than being whole beings. And so this anger Jesus says is so serious that he tells people, if you are going to make your offering at the altar, so give your offering, your tithe, your worship, giving something to the Lord, and you realize that a brother or sister has something against you, drop it and leave. Now, this has always struck me as dramatic. I think I've always had the idea, you know, growing up in church, we have the red offering plates going down the row. And what would have happened if someone before putting in their offering would have just stood up and walked out of church? Or, I mean, what might be more, uh, more common, they would stand up and walk to someone else in church, realizing that they had anger towards someone, or they had an issue that they needed to resolve and figure out, that they actually needed to do in an act of worship to, to God. Because being right, part of being right before God actually means that we're right before our brothers and sisters. And if we're living lives of pent-up anger, uh, even if we wouldn't consider it that, that that is chipping away at us and it's chipping away at the people around us. And as our anger, one thing I've noticed about my own self is that my anger, once it's triggered, it can just kind of keep getting hotter and hotter and more things. So I get angry in traffic a lot. I actually didn't know I was an angry person until I moved to the Twin Cities and I'm stuck in traffic all the time. I can get so angry with people in traffic and I don't even know who they are. But I realize that if I get angry with them there, I'm actually more likely to get angry in things at my job. I can be more likely to get angry with people who are around me. If I don't nip that anger in the bud, it actually grows like a fire and one that is much, much harder to control, much hotter, and much more dangerous to me and dangerous to the people around me. Our anger is serious business and has no place in the kingdom of God. So Jesus says, if you have something against someone, you got to drop and you got to go and find them and you got to work it out. This is important stuff, and I promise that I'm going to give you some practical handholds for it, but I want us to see how deeply important it is that our anger toward a brother or sister does not turn into the sort of burning fire that takes control of us and can take control of our relationships. Jesus even brings it to the level of, if you have something that's so high that it's getting to court, uh, you, you better work it out on the way, or else there are actual just practical consequences. You're going to lose a ton of money in this situation, so work it out. Now, I know that there are certainly places in our lives today where we need court systems to help us out. That's a good thing. But there's lots of situations that we actually could resolve on our own without it escalating that high if we would just be able to work on our own anger and talk about anger in healthy ways, seeking out reconciliation and resolution and forgiveness. Our anger toward a brother or sister is not glorifying to God. It is injurious to them to the point of murder, and Jesus fiercely commands against it. So what does this look like in our own lives? Because some of us have like burning anger problems. That's real. Um, but many of us have maybe the smaller fires, little fires of anger everywhere, if you will, uh, that end up going into a big one. Uh, that burns down a whole house. If you're familiar with the plotline of a recent show and, and book, little fires everywhere that eventually burns up a whole house, small fires of anger. So what does it look like for us to take care of those small fires of anger in our lives and in our relationships? I have some practical steps for you because right now you might be thinking about, oh man, 
I, that person I know was on the receiving end of my anger, my frustration, my tension. I need to go work that out with them. Or that person's anger toward me actually hurt me. And because we are both Christians in the kingdom of God, I actually need to say something for my benefit and for their benefit. And so that we can move together as partners um, in the kingdom of God and not as adversaries. So my practical tips for you are this. When you have conflict, especially the kind that has come about because of anger, but when you have conflict that you need to work through with someone, the first thing that I will say is this. Think about what's actually going on. I know that's vague, so I'm going to draw that one out. Think about what's actually going on. So first of all, what did I actually do wrong? Can I say what I did wrong in a scenario? Or if I'm talking to somebody else about a wrongdoing, do I know what it actually is that I am pointing out? Because sometimes I'm just angry about a ton of other stuff, and then I take it out on the person who's safest. And that's not fair either. So am I able to actually talk about what was wrong, what hurt me, what was difficult in a scenario? And then asking myself the question, can love cover it? Uh, the scripture says that love covers a multitude of sins. And so can love cover it? Uh, or do I actually need to talk about it with them and so that I can have a whole relationship with them? Secondly, after I've thought about, okay, what is actually going on? And can I address it clearly in my head and therefore verbally? Secondly, am I ready to not be defensive? Whether I'm the one who's approaching the conversation or being approached, whatever side I'm on, Defensiveness is just so easy, justifying what we did, explaining away why we did before we've even said I'm sorry, or before we've even gotten to the heart of something. Am I ready to go in and not be defensive? Am I ready to go in and not be accusatory? Am I ready to go into this conversation assuming the best of someone, uh, hoping for the best, viewing them with God's eyes, uh, and having that be what influences our conversation? And finally, am I genuinely ready uh, to have a forgiveness-oriented, hoped-for, reconciling sort of conversation. When I was in college, I was the queen of, I'm going to apologize to them so that they hopefully apologize to me. That's a terrible system, like just making up and apologize so someone else apologizes to you. But we do it all the time, folks. Uh, so am I able to go into that conversation really able to seek out forgiveness, and to hope for reconciliation. Sometimes reconciliation isn't always possible on this side of heaven, but forgiveness is. Now, I want to be clear about a couple of things. I told you all the things I am talking about, but I do want to be clear, first of all, that we all have different cultural and family expectations around conflict, around difficult conversations. So that's why I give you four heart postures rather than giving direct instructions. You may have to contextualize this, and if you're a little confused, particularly about how this works in your ethnic context, Think of a wise mentor who maybe could walk you through it. And secondly, I also want to be clear that there are certain sins, there are certain things that you probably cannot engage in an individual conversation, particularly as we think about situations of abuse. So I do want you to know that's a separate category than the bigger category that I'm talking about here, um, the category where we can actually resolve these things on our own, okay? Folks, I believe that one of the reasons that Jesus has people leave the altar to go deal with relational dissonance is because I think it's one of our biggest points of witness to the world. That if we as Christians can be a reconciling people, being a people who does not let our anger get out of control, but rather keeps short record, talks things through with people, and lives in harmony with one another in the kingdom of God, I think that can be one of our biggest witnesses to the world. And so tonight, I'm going to encourage you, if you have something you need to take care of, uh, if you tend to have kind of an anxious personality where you act right away and then it's not good, you maybe need to take a minute to pray about it. Uh, but if you're feeling a genuine sense of conviction from the Holy Spirit, you know what that is. If you feel a genuine sense of conviction right now, I'm going to encourage you to go have the conversation that you need to have to make things right with someone. We need to be apology, I'm sorry people, and we need to be I forgive you people in the kingdom of God. We need to be people uh, who do not let our anger inhumanize those around us, but rather have our character be formed and shaped by Jesus, the one who in every opportunity he had actually didn't get defensive or accusatory or retaliate, but instead paid the ultimate price for us so that we could have life in him. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I do pray that we would be a reconciling people. I pray that we would be a people who is conscious of our anger toward people, toward relationships, in a way that we put that fire out quickly. And Jesus, I ask for your help in that.
I pray over the conversations that many of us need to have, working things out with people around us so that we can be in right relationship, that you would give wisdom and words to say, and that you, as the ultimate reconciler, would bring healing to the places that need it. We love you in your name. Amen. Whether you took me up on my recommendation to take some notes or not, you do have the next minute now to reflect, perhaps pray, and record on paper or in your phone how you would like to respond tonight. And then I would like you to take that response and bring it to your processing room that will be happening right after this, eight o'clock. Be ready with it, whether you're ready to share or not, um, bring it to that and then uh, you will have an opportunity in the next hour uh, to debrief with others. Let's take a moment to reflect now. friends before we go just a few more closing announcements okay now just like yesterday response rooms are still open if you'd like to receive prayer or ask questions or talk to somebody about planting an inner varsity ministry near you links for those response rooms as well as the quiet time material is in the upper right hand corner of our website and speaking of those devotionals they're legit whether you followed the guide, listen to the podcast, or join the Zoom room, our prayer is that your quiet times with the Lord are fruitful. So please continue to make them a priority. And if you haven't checked them out yet, tomorrow morning could just be the perfect time for you. Like I said, the links are in the upper right-hand corner of our website. And if you're coming back to the Zoom room tomorrow morning from 9 to 9.30 Central, word on the street is Lacey will be there participating with you all as well. Yes, I will. So please, would you come join me? And if you haven't seen enough of our faces, you can follow us on Instagram and check out our Insta story throughout the week. Tonight, I'll actually be answering a question from one of you, and you can ask us even more questions in the next few days. Otherwise, of course, we will be seeing you back here tomorrow. Live at 7 o'clock Central. That's right. This bump, maybe, <laughs> if I get the right direction. <laughs>